Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. This is Ukraine War News Update, first part thereof for the 27th of March 2024. Let's get straight to it. We go to the Ukrainian general star figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply, you can find them in the description to the video below. Don't hit me with why don't you give me Russian statistics. The Russian stats are so far gone uh, and so fanciful that they're not worth talking about even where well, as as I've said many times before if they're reporting that the Ukrainians some months and months ago half a year ago were reporting they'd lost double the amount of airframes they actually started the war with you know it's not worth looking at the Russian figures the Ukrainian figures as I've shown I think over the course of the war are somewhat accurate and I think really pretty accurate certainly in terms of the vehicles uh, that have been lost personnel is much more difficult to uh, to evaluate I think because of the guesstimation that must be um, must be used to try and work out these numbers nonetheless it does give you a trend and that we are over a thousand from yesterday tells us that something happened yesterday more than it was happening the day before okay so the previous few days we've been down around a 700 mark I think it ticked up a little bit yesterday but a few days before that uh, much lower now we're up to over a thousand so fairly significant activities taking place although 11 tanks is not the biggest number uh, still significant nine apvs is below average 27 artillery systems is above average one anti-aircraft warfare system depends what that is 41 vehicles and fuel tanks and five pieces of special equipment so the figures are a bit all over the place um, we will look at Andrew Perpetua's lost stats to try and get a, an idea of what's gone on. There is s uh, quite a bit to discuss in terms of actually his uh, collection of data. And we're going to we're going to drop into uh, some points that he was making in his live stream last night. But as you can see from this list, the Ukrainians have had the better of of it over the last day, as they have a lot over the course of the war and recently. To the point where, I mean, this looks about a four, maybe four to one Ukra Russian to Ukrainian loss ratio. Could even be as high as five to one. And that's exactly what the Ukrainians will need if they will prevail in this war. If it gets below three to one, I, even as bad as that sounds, like the, the Russians losing twice as many vehicles as the Ukrainians is not good enough for the Ukrainians because the Russians just have so many vehicles, uh, both in deep storage and uh, general usage. Right, the Ukrainians here uh, losing a radar system, another P-18 Malachite radar. That is a sore loss for the Ukrainians. Their comms equipment, evacuation robots, um, uh, and a few bits and pieces. Armada there being captured, and we'll show you that in a second. Uh, M113 disabled by mine. So it's that Malachite radar, I think. Marda, Marda being captured is not good. Uh, we'll see what the Russians have lost. Well, they've lost a Book 1 um, air defence system from a Gimlers, a guided multiple launch rocket system, something like a HIMARS. Uh, a R330 Jetel uh, electronic warfare system. Sync drone drop bombs. We'll actually show you that too. as interesting because they are uh, IEDs dropped from a fixed wing drone almost acting like a bomber um surveillance and comms equipment a couple of them some artillery uh, a number of tanks uh, t80s t72s and then as per normal quite a vast list of infantry fighting vehicles of a number of different variants a few apcs trucks and atvs civilian vehicles and all sorts so just the massive stuff that the russians have lost there adding up to you know, really meaningful considerable losses to the russians right Okay, we're going to start with, uh, after, after those stats, with this claim from Operational Command South saying in the Krinky area, constant losses of the Russians amount to 60 to 70% of the personnel. I don't really know what that means. Uh, what personnel? The personnel in the whole front line? Uh, if that's the case, then that's quite incredible. And those higher numbers that we saw here, 1,030, might have something to do with Krinky. We know that the Russians have attacked a number of times over the last few days in Krinky unsuccessfully and so the um, uh, the implication could be that they have lost uh, a number of personnel in that particular area uh, which they have done uh, consistently oh since they've been trying to dis dislodge the ukrainians from the left bank and the Dnipro there right oh uh, here we have that book missile system operators a third 
separate um, regiment of the Special Forces destroyed an enemy book system during reconnaissance operations in the Zaporizhia direction. The soldiers directed HIMARS fire of a missile and artillery unit of the Defence Forces at the enemy target. Uh, so that's one of these things of you know, constantly surveying surveying the area, looking for targets, finding a target, getting hold of the HIMARS. And good thing about HIMARS is you can get that time-sensitive target that might move destroyed really quickly. This is the advantage the Ukrainians have over the Russians and the advantage they need to keep. Okay, They need that HIMARS advantage, so they need HIMARS systems and HIMARS ammunition a plenty so they can keep doing things like that okay um this is the marder that's been captured russian soldier demonstrates a german made marder 1a3 ifv that was captured from the ukrainians near avdivka and evacuated to the rear the vehicle appears to be fully intact with some minor damage in several places it's got the ammunition still inside i mean this is a real shame the complaint at the beginning of the war that with the Russians is that they were not following protocol and dropping hand grenades down their vehicles after they abandoned them. They just abandoned them in the field, left the hatches open, did a runner. And this was happening right at the beginning of the war. You remember the amount of, of uh, video footage we were seeing of drones dropping hand grenades down abandoned vehicles and then everyone's saying it's the end of the tank because look, they can get blown up by IEDs. They're only getting blown up by these uh, IEDs. They get blown up by drones the only the only reason they're being blown up is because they've been abandoned right but th th that told us a number of things but firstly that the russians weren't doing what they should have been trained to do which is not leave the hatches open but i tell you what um throw in a couple of grenades close the hatch and then and then run off or you leave the hatch open because actually you want it to be blown up but what you don't want is the enemy to get hold of that vehicle and be able to use it against you Right, so you need to disable the vehicle and fund. You know what we have heard some people doing is firing off all the ammunition before abandoning it, and that would have been really important for the Ukrainians to do there because the Russians wouldn't be able to get hold of ammunition to fire out the Marder, right? But leaving the entire vehicle intact for the Russians to use against you, that's a problem. Now, even as expensive as a Marder might be, or as, as valuable as it might be to the Ukrainians, it, you don't want the Russians to get hold of it in 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 a good state right here we have uh andrew perpetua's live stream from last night and this is oh i've got to goodness me too many tabs open and and uh it can't handle it so this is always worth looking at andrew perpetua's live stream right what happened is this is attorney torska area i'm just giving i think this is an insight into just how much equipment the russians have lost particularly and how it's a lot more than we think so what happened is they, they've been mapping and, and uh, with each of these uh, vehicles that they find, there's a geolocation that goes along with it and there's a video footage. If you go to the original, um, like I always say, if you go to the original Google Docs, next to each of these is a, um, is a UIL that tells you, you the, that gives you the visual confirmation for the claim here, right? So all of these are visually confirmed. But they're using generally like 70 centimeter, which is 70 centimeters per pixel of resolution imagery, satellite imagery, because that's the cheapest. To get a high resolution, like 30 centimeter um, uh, imagery is far more expensive. So a 30 centimeter per pixel resolution image for this square there costs about $400 and you're not allowed to share it with anyone. So you have to keep it internally. So he can't share that with with his viewers. Now, with that, he's able to see in much finer detail what is taking place in this whole area. And they found out some fascinating things. So the first thing to note is that they had previously, once you take out duplicates, had 96 vehicles that they had already geolocated in that one area. So although there are 96 blue spots here, the blue spots are for Russian losses, the red spots are for Ukrainian losses. So although there aren't 96 spot uh, pins here, each of them might have like three vehicles at that point, right, or maybe more. And so 96 vehicles in this area, and what they found out from the higher resolution imagery, two things. One, there were another 50 vehicles. So in other words, there are another 52 vehicles that they hadn't previously seen because the resolution was so good. And, and what that means is that, you know, when they spot vehicles and geolocate vehicles, but there's another 50% to add on to that. 
So they only have like two thirds at any one time. So when we're when we're looking at this every day, like this represents two. Certainly with the uh, Russians, I can't speak for the Ukrainian losses, but for the Russian losses, you can add another fifty percent onto there if you can extrapolate this data across the whole front line. Of course, you know there might be problems with doing so. Um, the other thing they found out is that many of the vehicles they had already geolocated were no longer there. And it, that differed from spot to spot, but over overall, so in one area, like 13.5% of the vehicles have been recovered. So you, you're clocking these losses, then they disappear, and you don't know which side has taken them. We've got a Marder there that's, okay, that's an outright captured one. Um, but, you know, what, what's happening to these damaged ones? Which side is taking them? Are both sides taking them? Can we can we find out which side is doing what? There was, uh, well, there was a theory, for example, that there were two um, Strids Farm 122, which is the Leopard 2A5 Swedish variant that were were in one place and then disappeared. And then there was another example of two Strids Farm next to each other getting hit by lancets and being damaged and then being moved again. And the you could make an inference there that those two strigs farm were recovered by the Ukrainians and then were hit again and then recovered again. Um, but but you just don't know. Anyway, it was fascinating, you know, listening to uh, details about all of these vehicles and just quite how many pieces of kit the Russians have lost. Really fascinating stuff. He's talked about it a little bit. So um, he was saying, look, here here's just one image where you've got of all the vehicles here, you know, five out of these eight were were recovered. Uh, one's just been moved. Uh, three out of five streets farm one two two were recovered, presumably by Ukraine. BGBV uh, one twenty and a CV ninety also recovered. Map going clockwise, right to left, and then he details that. Notably, the two Brem that towed the streets farm one two two were recovered. So that's what a video I showed you recently where you had. A Brem towing a Brem towing a Strigs Farm 122, and these were Russians trying to take a, a Ukrainian damaged Strigs Farm 122. And then the Ukrainians hit the Brems with uh, with drones and incapacitated the Brems. Well, those themselves were later recovered. And it's interesting that Russians decided to recover their recovery vehicle vehicles rather than to recover the the really good Ukrainian tank. So the really good Ukrainian tank was less valuable to the Russians than the recovery vehicles themselves. That is fascinating. Um, he says, I can't tell you who recovered any particular vehicle, only to tell you that they're no longer there. Um, okay, so he goes on to say, going through high res finding vehicles, uh, going through high res satellite imagery and finding vehicles we missed. All the green eyeballs we didn't know about. So these are vehicles that are new, newly found on the high resolu resolution imagery. Russia loses more vehicles than we know from video alone. Although they've also recovered a bunch, I need to make a recovered vehicle icon. Um, so these, for example, were recovered. Uh, I keep finding more. First pass on a high res image. Probably need to look at a dozen more times to find everything. Found 52 new destroyed vehicles and fixed coordinates on everything. Now everything is perfectly located. So in this area, we had 102 vehicles taking out duplicates. Uh, that's 96 vehicles. I can buy um, th uh, 13 of which were recovered. Uh, meaning that of the ones they'd already found, not obviously the new ones, the ones they'd already, because you wouldn't know of any new ones being recovered. There could be some that you're just missing, some some that have been recovered that you don't know about, that were, uh, know that they were originally lost. But anyway, 13.5% of the identified vehicles were recovered in that section. Uh, and then they found 52 unmapped vehicles. So that is 13 recovered and currently 135 destroyed and abandoned, equaling 148 in total. Uh, that is about seven and a half vehicles per square kilometer. I'll probably find more. About 10% recovered is about what I've seen every time I've, be, I've bought an image. Actually, I think the last image I bought, which had around 150 vehicles, around 5% were recovered. So that's variable, depends where they are, how far behind lines that the, 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 these losses are. Every image I bought, I was missing a substantial number of vehicles between a third and two thirds of the vehicle total were missing. So it even could be even higher than, than one third being missing. 
Uh, in other words, you know, you could you could in certain places add fifty percent on or or sixty six percent. He's saying that onto some of these vehicle loss statistics. So I think that was a really revealing uh, part of the video where he's talking about that. And it, you know, if if anyone, I mean, this is where if I was a millionaire, I would go to to Andrew and say, mate, four hundred dollars a pop. Here's ten thousand dollars. You know, go and go and map the whole front line, or twenty thousand dollars. Go and map the whole front line and get some people on it, because this is really useful information, 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 and it gives us a, a better sense of what's going on of reality. Um, okay, you talking about the Chinese Chinese golf carts, the uh, the Desert Cross one thousand dash threes. Next to here, saying they've become coffin on coffins on wheels for Russian soldiers. Uh, Ukraine has learned how to destroy Chinese golf carts. Uh, Chinese Desert Cross 1000-3 motorized cross-country vehicles, and as a result, they have become coffins on wheels for Russian soldiers. Ukrainian drone operators are targeting them with kamikaze drones, and since the buggies have no armor, all the soldiers inside die, writes build analyst uh, Julian Rupka. Now, I, I can't talk to how accurate that is. I, I don't know... Well, I don't know how much value these vehicles have, whether, like I keep saying, are they using them because they have to, because they don't have any other choices, or do they offer some kind of advantage in certain situations? Are they coffins on wheels? I certainly wouldn't want to drive them, uh, driving one of them compared to driving in a in an infantry fighting vehicle, that's for sure. Um, right, uh, in Luhansk Oblast, roughly 20 kilometers behind the front, a Ukrainian fixed-wing bomber drone conducts a precise strike targeting a Russian Zhitel. So here we have, it almost looks like World War II footage in black and white here, and seeing these, these bombs drop out of... Uh, of the drone that's looking down but it's interesting that you've got fixed wing um, drones now doing bombing missions in this case destroying a really high value electronic warfare system and that's probably the Chattel that's listed on uh, on there in fact it is because he, he talks about the, the the drone that dropped it right uh, Daniela who did that last Friday did that analysis of the drone warfare uh, along the front lines with me and that was really good and then I gave an update to his stats and actually he he the he had just misrepresented some of the stats that he's picked up here uh but interesting what what changing that shows so thanks uh I discovered a mistake in in the code which did not sum the Ukrainian strikes together as it should conversely the Russian side was properly calculated. So all the Russian stats were fine, it's just a few of the Ukrainian stats. This led to an underestimation of only two graphs, the total progression and the difference. The overall results did not change, but we can now see the effect of logistical problems in December 2023 and the progressive improvements. The reason for such an explosion in the chart? Well, attacks on the infantry skyrocketed and those on vehicles were, were steadily very high. So I think here he has... It's this is one of the biggest differences. So I think that was the, these both of these were down here and it wasn't calculated properly. This is the difference between in March the total Ukrainian uh, drone uses and the total Russian uses. That's being a bit uh, funky there. So um, I don't know. Surely that should be above what it was. Maybe that was the original mistake. Um, um, but nonetheless, uh, he, he's just, for those of you who have been following him, uh, he has updated the, the stats uh, and, and made them correct. Uh, and as you can see, that is a significant, significant difference, although there is a catch up now going on to what they were, the, the Russian FPV strikes on infantry. You can see that Ukrainians have really, uh, really taken that and gone with it. And here, just these strikes on vehicles is phenomenal. The same for last month, even though there are a few days so far in this month. And the Russians seem to have struggled to hit vehicles. And that might have something to do with the Ukrainians using fewer of them. But I, I um, updated you with that the other day. And here is uh, Daniela just giving a, a little bit more accurate information on that. Uh, Ukraine has destroyed or disabled a third of Russia's Black Sea warships, in the, according to the Ukrainian Navy. Our ultimate goal, I love it. Yesterday I was called out by a Russian troll. It's like, you're such disinformation. It's like the Ukrainian, I was talking about how the Russians stole 
a bunch of naval ships off the Ukrainians when they annexed Crimea. And he came on the thread and he's like, blah, 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 you do realise that 50,000 Ukrainian Navy members defected to the Russian Navy. I was like, dude, take your trolling elsewhere. There was only 13,600 Ukrainian Navy members at, in 2014. Like for 50,000 of them to uh to to defect is like three times the amount of people in the navy and this is just the nonsense that russian trolls uh talk anyway our ultimate goal is a complete absence of military ships in the so-called russian federation of the in the azov and black sea regions according to platenchuk uh, on behalf of the ukrainian navy so they are doing a really good job there in terms of taking out the navy uh, last night, 10 out of 13 Shahids were shot down. I don't know if any details of the three that weren't or any falling debris. I don't know where they were particularly. In fact, it seemed to be a relatively quiet night. Uh, explosions were being reported in Belgorod. Heavy explosions there. So the Ukrainians obviously paying some attention to the Russians. Now, the this is the CHPP. CHPP means Combined Heat and Power Plant in Kharkiv. So with soviet uh, cities and the legacy with the soviet era and, and in ukraine many cities have central heating if you like for entire buildings so where we would build in in the uk you have central heating in, in your houses that you're responsible for yourself so you, you build a new house or you get an apartment block and everyone has their own heating and you use different electricity companies or whatever well in these big sort of soviet era cities you have entire apartment blocks in the city just in general being heated centrally um by and so you get these big pipes that go along the the uh the roads or whatever uh, in the city and that, that's providing heat for uh for entire areas and for that you need combined heat and power plants that's how i understand it um, and these getting destroyed obviously can have a real effect on people's ability not only to get electricity to, but to get heat as well um, and the CHPP5 in Kharkiv uh, was destroyed as a result of the attack on March the 22nd that's what it looks like now and apparently not only will Kharkiv in general take a few weeks to fully restore power to so they're obviously going to have to take power from elsewhere but that local power plant here will take several years to rebuild this is what Russia is successfully doing to Ukraine at the moment. They are having... I, don't, I wonder whether in, in some ways their attacks on energy infrastructure is being more successful this time around, uh, maybe with the, the types of um, munitions they are using. Sorry, much needed tea break. Um, so moving on. In Russia, however, where air defense systems are operating and... Uh, they are getting overwhelmed or not not being successful in terms of trying to shoot down drones around oil refineries. In Russia, air defense operators are punished for the successful attacks of Ukrainian drones on oil depots. This creates additional tension and stress among military personnel, says the partisan group Atesh. Uh, this can lead to demotion in military rank, imposition of fines and sending, uh, sending the personnel to war in Ukraine. So it's quite draconian rules. Uh, they're obviously not a big fan of having their oil refineries uh, taken out. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about these these new missiles, the Zircon or Zircon missiles that the Russians have been starting or are starting to use from Crimea. So they can get from Crimea to Kiev in apparently six minutes um, there. And apparently the, in the attack on Kiev, they only had three minutes worth of warning. Uh, so it can go in maybe half halfway before you get the warning. If I don't know the trajectory of these, but it, they might go up into the atmosphere. So it might be that they, the, and then as they're starting to come down, that's when you when you spot them. I don't know. Anyway, six minutes to Kiev, five and a half to Venetia, Zaporizhia three and a half, Odessa two and a half minutes, and that's how quickly the Russian Zircon missile reaches um, cities of Ukraine. So you can imagine if you're firing them at Odessa you've got virtually no time to be able to do something about that. John Ridge does an excellent analysis of what the Zircon is and whether it's a hypersonic uh, anti-ship cruise missile or whether it's got supersonic elements. So it, it, does it go really, really fast? I think hypersonics are over Mach 5, is it? Um, 
uh, and he says, well, the answer is yes. And he goes into very detailed analysis of what he can find out about this missile and how high it flies, its trajectory, uh, the, the speed with which it flies in, for most of its a journey, so on and so forth. Um, and he's, it's kind of like, yeah, it's got elements of hypersonic, so on and so forth. Uh, finally, the employment circle not only highlights Ukraine's need for sustained and sophisticated uh, anti well, air defense assets, uh, it reinforces the urgency with which US and allies must continue to field new AMD capabilities to defeat Russian and Chinese hypersonic threats. So this is something that uh, the the Americans will be looking at and learning from as these newer missiles come online uh, and they have to work out how best to counter them. But you can go and look at that thread. It's a bit too technical for this news piece um, and very detailed, uh, but well worth looking at. Um, air alerts will be more frequent in Kiev and the region due to the long-range Zircon missiles, of which Russia has accumulated several dozen, and that's coming from Natalia Humenyuk, a spokesperson of the Military Command South, uh, she adds that Russia has a new tactic, targeted terror, and a capital is the main target. Interesting that they're going to be starting to hit Kiev more consistently, possibly, if that's to be believed. And that's the place with the best air defences. And maybe they have um, confidence that they can overcome those Patriot air defences or exhaust them. Uh, there isn't much Russia can do with Sircon, though, says John Ridge. They can't already do with the Iskander M and the Kinjal. Aside from prosecuting specific assets in Kiev, the only added utility would be presenting stressing engagements to the US Patriot Factory to force it to ripple fire Pac-3 MSE. So what I think the Russians might be trying to do is, because they can fire them from Crimea and they don't have to fire them from airplanes or 295s or whatever in Russia, it could be they have these as well as the Kinjals and the Iskander M and it just means that they can overcome Kiev's uh, Patriot battle, uh, Patriot air defense systems and get them to exhaust their missiles. So we'll see how that develops over the next few weeks, I guess. Right, moving on to other bits and pieces. Ivana Stradner, who's an expert of the, of, the, of the Balkan area and the Russian influence there, says nobody should be surprised that there's a full campaign blaming Ukraine and the collective West, as they call it. So we're going to return to this idea that the Crocus City Hall uh, ISIS terrorist attack is very formally being blamed on Ukraine and the US, and indeed the Brits to some degree, by the Russians. And this is a, a bit of an issue. However... <laughs> Lukashenko, Lukashenko, who is the dictator in charge of Belarus, has claimed that the Moscow attackers who were trying to flee uh, the that um, attack in in Moscow and they were caught somewhere near in was it the Bel no in the Bryansk region near Belarus. The Russians are claiming they were trying to get to Ukraine. Lukashenko has come out and said they were trying to get to Belarus, which then undermines Putin's whole narrative. I thought that's pretty interesting. Uh, he said that the suspects who carried out the terrorist attack in Moscow on March 22nd initially tried to flee to Belarus, according to state-run news uh, outlet Belter. So, yeah, not towing the party line there. Members of Putin's entourage do not believe that Ukraine was involved in the terrorist attack on Crocus City Hall, according to Bloomberg, citing four sources close to the Kremlin. However, despite the complete lack of evidence and proof, the Kremlin has decided to develop a version of the Ukraine trace to rally Russians around the war with Ukraine. I was talking about rally around a flag and how it will do his um, popularity some good and also help to de demonize, as it says, the enemy here so that he can justify a uh, calling it a war and then a mass mobilization. According to the interlocutors, the Kremlin was shocked by the FSB's failure. Interesting. Lawyers of the accused in the terrorist attack at the Croker City Hall are threatened to cut by having their, their own ears cut off. Also, unknown persons promise to kill the families of the lawyers if they do not withdraw from the case, according to Russian media. At the same time, if the defendants withdraw from the case, it will have to be taken by another lawyer, otherwise a trial will not take place. If you want to have some pretense that it's a rules-based system, you need to be able to have someone representing them in trial. As horrific as the event is and as horrible as those people are, you know, this is the principle of a legal as a, of a functioning legal system. And the problem with Russia putting on, you know, releasing onto Telegram their own security forces cutting off their one of the 
uh, one of the suspect's ears and force feeding it to them and then connecting another suspect's testicles to an electric battery and, and, and torturing them and be just generally beating them quite overtly. The problem with that is that you are, you are moving away from the rules-based order and you are advocating vigilanteism and anything goes and then the whole system starts falling apart. But of course, you know, that that is kind of, I guess, a, a further move towards authoritarianism. Oliver Carroll here says, um, I don't, I'm not sure the beginning there, he's very close to the Russian security establishment. Uh, by the way, it's where Patrushev often places his loony. Oh, no, sorry. It's the Argumenti e Facti. So this is the um, the newspaper here. It's very close to the Russian security establishment. Um, it's where Patrushev often places his loony anti-Western op-eds, which I once thought were too trippy to be real, but now I'm starting to believe they are actually sincerely held opinions. So what's this? Well, Steve Rosenberg, is saying, who's a BBC, ex excellent BBC reporter, who's doing a, f a phenomenal job still in Moscow. And he's he's navigating a very fine line there um but but he's garnering quite a lot of um respect for the work he's doing consistently out there he said there's one extraordinary front page today in russia which sums up moscow's attempts to link ukraine and the west to crocus city and the concert hall massacres uh, and uh, um so as he's uh as he's reading here it says so the yellow is um, what it actually says. We know the architects of the Crocus terrorist attack and who organised it, says the front page. Uh, may they burn in hell. All this about Islamic State is rubbish. Let them tell this to each other. So, uh, and, and who is the them? Well, as you can see on the front page, Zelensky and Biden. And here he says the whole article is alleging an American footprint in the Crocus tragedy with arguments like, Terrorism was a standard tool of the West for decades, so on and so forth. I mean, you, you get the picture, but what I'm trying to tell you is it's very much open and sanctioned by Russia. In fact, Putin's come out and said some more nonsense that, that essentially is blaming the US and Ukraine, obviously, for the terrorist attack. This, is, this should be met with a massive rebuttal from, from the US in my books. This is this is pretty terrible, especially when it's coming from, you know, yes, you could say it's propaganda coming through the media, but if it's sanctioned by the Russian state and if it's coming from the mouths of people like Patrushev, I don't know that article was from Patrushev, then I think the US is justified in, in answering, but of course they're going to be worrying about escalation. And in, in the meantime, and this is unsurprising because this happened after 9-11 and terrorist attacks in London, but Russian police are looking for far-right activists. These are people who are Zeke Heiling. Uh, that's a slight difference here, is that the overt... Um, far right ultra nationalism, which is allowed to being allowed to bubble to the fore in Russia, is bizarrely ironic. In by point of fact that the Russians accuse everyone else of being Nazis, and and the Ukrainians, and and they're the ones that that pride themselves on defeating Nazism in the in the Second World War, and yet so much so many young men in. Uh, in Russia appear to be embracing Nazism in their tattoos and you know, cultural symbology, but in like Zeke Heiling and, and far right act activism such as this, which is which is caught on uh, on camera where they were absolutely um, harassing a woman from Yakutia, so ethnic area of Russia, uh, saying Russia is for Russians and uh, so on and so forth. Um, giving a Nazi salute, shouting glory to Tsak, who uh, is a Russian neo-Nazi ideologue who died in prison in 2020. Now, the Russian uh, police have come out and said they're looking for those guys, but, you know, this stuff is allowed to bubble. Now, I want to just return, because I think this is so important. I talk about it all the time, but Russian disinformation is is part of this hybrid warfare and we need to do something about it here's ukraine the latest podcast talking yesterday about this with regard to the um uh, to the crocus city hall attack uh, and we'll join them oops see no evidence 
of a connection with Ukraine and the Western intelligence agencies have been quick to say the same. Perhaps that is why the Kremlin has launched a disinformation campaign spreading false claims that MI6 and other Western intelligence agencies were actually responsible for Friday's terror attack in Moscow. Extraordinary story, this. So a network of automated bot social media accounts have been sharing links to fake websites designed to look like well-known news outlets that blame the West for the massacre. The Insider have done an in-depth report on this. And according to examinations by the Facebook parent company Meta Platforms, the spam attack was carried out by the Russian IT company's National Technologies and Social Design Agency, both of which fall under EU sanctions and have been linked directly to the Kremlin. So the owner of National Technologies is Rostec, Russia's state-owned defence conglomerate, headed by a former KGB agent and a close associate of Putin. Now, one of the bot network's claims designed to implicate UK intelligence services is that British authorities said Ukraine was not involved almost immediately after the attack, thereby suggesting they knew something about it. In a separate example, a clone of the German publication Der Spiegel published a piece titled A terrorist attack in Russia raises the question of Ukraine's cooperation with Islamist terrorist groups. This... And of course, if you've taken screenshots of these and they're made to look like the Spiegel and these go viral across, say, Twitter or whatever, then you are feeding people with this sense that genuine mainstream media outlets are floating the idea that the US, Ukraine, UK are partly responsible or fully responsible for the terrorist attacks on Moscow and they do their job. This operation is carried out by two principal methods with some bots posting false stories on their own Twitter accounts and others sharing it in the comment section of unrelated posts such as threads on football matches, TV shows, Dominic Nichols quiff in order to gain traction. And it's this kind of activity, the methods of spreading false information, which was discussed by the British government yesterday in its rebuke of China, Russian and Iranian hostile activity. Indeed, both American and British authorities released a statement announcing they knew of Chinese sweeping state-backed operations that targeted US officials, journalists, corporations, pro-democracy activists and the UK's election watchdog, and thereby announced a set of criminal charges and sanctions as a consequence. As I said yesterday, it's quite an interesting intervention and we will reflect more deeply on it in another episode. But turning it back to the fallout from this attack, I was waiting to see what President Emmanuel Macron of France would say, given his recent adoption of a more hawkish stance on the war in Ukraine. He's now echoed the remarks of other Western governments, saying, and I quote, it would be both cynical and counterproductive for Russia itself and the security of its citizens to use this context to try and turn it against Ukraine. He then joined the United States in saying intelligence indicated Islamic State was responsible. Quote, the information available to us, as well as our main partners, indicates indeed that it was an entity of the Islamic State which instigated this attack. So on and so forth. And it's interesting that they've raised um, security levels in France uh, ahead of potential uh, terrorist attacks there. There's obviously very large Muslim contingents within, uh, from the sort of macro band, the, the, the North African um, migrants that, that uh, live across France. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, delicacy that has to be, um, that they have to treat uh, the, their own domestic issues with in France. Now, uh, I think the disinformation battle or war is is one that is is raging and as I keep saying we're not doing enough about it and as I mentioned the other day it's gone as far as uh, stories to do with the Princess of Wales for example in the UK. Uh, Shashank Jossi is referring to a BBC article saying Dr John Rosenbeek an expert on disinformation at KCL says such Russian involvement in conspiracy theories is topic agnostic. So this is really important in that they don't really care about the subject. It can be anything that pushes buttons and adds to social tensions. So that's why I was saying the other day, you know, that they, they'll, they'll get involved in stuff that's just either outright divisive 
or almost creates divisions where there might not have been them. A Professor Innes has identified a Russian disinformation group involved in this. It's not a state entity, but it's linked to people who have been sanctioned recently in the United States over claims they are part of a malign influence campaign that spread fake news. So is that anything is fair game, it seems, for, for Russian um, troll farm involvement. Uh, and we've seen that either, even with the, the ship going into the bridge in Baltimore. Um, people given the Biden government the fault... Uh, that a bridge collapse after a cargo ship drove into it is insane. But of course, this is the sort of thing, and there will be some Americans who will be going along with that because they hate Biden so much that even a even a massive cargo ship driving into a into a bridge is somehow Biden's fault. But that's the sort of thing that will be will be shouted about by Russian troll farms for absolute sure. I mean, someone just sent me this yesterday uh, saying, look, in my even in my local area, we've got stop the war. We've got Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam and then Ukraine up the top there. And this is being paid for by Ronald Young, whoever he is in some kind of area. Your vote is important. This is the sort of anti-Ukraine rhetoric from from people who are arguably victim to these disinformation campaigns and it's absolutely uh, it's 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 a real it's just such a challenge to us all and it's a fight we'll be continually fighting going forward Ivana Stradna as as mentioned the uh, expert on the Balkans talks about this in terms of a massive propaganda act campaign against NATO for the past few days it's time to give Putin a taste of his own medicine and fight back in the information space but how uh, background this week marked the 25th anniversary of NATO's intervention against Serbia in 1999 to halt the human rights abuses per per perpetrated against the ethnic Albanian population in Kosovo at Russia's request the UN Security Council plans to discuss NATO's intervention. Why? This is part of the Kremlin's effort to paint NATO and the United States as hostile actors, thereby justifying Russia's own aggression against Ukraine. Putin has characterised NATO's intervention as an act of savagery. For example, Moscow and Belgrade, so that's the Serbian capital, accused NATO of littering the battlefield with munitions containing depleted uranium, which they claim, without scientific evidence, has contributed to rising cancer rates. Even as Russia portrays NATO as the aggressor in Kosovo, Moscow also points to the 1999 intervention as a supposed the precedent for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. If NATO can intervene in Yugoslavia on humanitarian grounds, Moscow argues, Russia can do the same in Ukraine. The Kremlin similarly points to Kosovo to justify its illegal occupation of Crimea. After Russia annexed the peninsula in 2014, Putin argued that the Russian-controlled Crimean parliament is a, quote, legitimate body of authority that, quote, adopted a declaration of independence just as Kosovo did. Why should the West care? On March 5th, the US Office of the Director of National Intelligence warned of an increased risk of inter-ethnic violence in 2024, in the Western Balkans and Russia and Serbia are setting informational conditions for more escalations in the region. More on this in the geopolitical video later. The US and its allies can't afford to be passive. In the face of Russia's lies, Western governments do a decent job of fact-checking Russian disinformation, but that's not enough. They should target the pro-Russian nationalistic Serbs. Okay, so what should the West really do? Western messaging should remind pro-Russian Serbs that history shows Russia to be an unreliable ally, despite Moscow's promise of support and brotherhood and its efforts to push Serbia into a new conflict with Kosovo and NATO, Russia is actually unlikely to help Belgrade. For example, when the Yugoslav Federal Parliament voted to join the alliance with Russia and Belarus during NATO's intervention in 1999, Moscow said yet to its Slavic brothers, stating that Russian military involvement was unaffordable. In addition, the West could point to Russia's 2003 withdrawal from the NATO-led peacekeeping mission in Kosovo and mock them how they left their Slavic brothers. Why stop there? Western information operations could also mock Russia's delivery of S 300 air defence systems to Serbia before NATO's intervention in 1999, noting that the systems proved useless because they arrived incomplete. As Russia rolls out its latest disinformation campaign against NATO, it's time for the West to turn the tables and take the fight to the Kremlin. Remind pro-Moscow Serbs that with friends like Putin, they don't need em enemies. Unfortunately, this is just my wishful thinking. During the Cold War, we had brave leaders who didn't fear to challenge the Kremlin, and Reagan unapologetically had used offensive information operations. Unfortunately, today, risk aversion is awarded in politics. It will change. So... Exactly what I was talking about yesterday, which is we need to be taking the fight in the information space to the uh, Russians or the Serbians or, you know, uh, Hungary or Slovakia or wherever it is where Russian disinformation is, is finding uh, a, a finding fertile ground. And we need to be 
presenting uh, an argument or a counter narrative. Now, it's not about lying. It's not about manipulating the population with propaganda that's overt disinformation, but it's about telling truths that are particularly strategic truths, right? So in this case, it's like, oh, you think Russia's a good mate? Well, how, how about we look into history, how they screwed you over here, here, and you know, let's talk about the S300s and all that. I think that's a really interesting thread there for Stradner. And I'd like to develop those ideas uh, as we go forward, you know, into the next few months of this war. Um, at the same time, the UN has uh, reported that at least 32 Ukrainian prisoners of war have been executed in Russian captivity during the winter. Um, you know, what more do we need to say about war crimes and, and good guys and bad guys and all that kind of stuff? The Colonel General of the Russian Customs Service has been detained. Deputy Head of the Federal Customs Service, Yelena Yagodkina, has been detained in Moscow on suspicion of corruption. Um, wow, they're actually doing something about corruption, or maybe they're just finding a full guy for some other issue. Now, uh, this was big news really yesterday. Zelensky dismissed Alexei Danilov from the post of Secretary of National Security and Defence Council. Alexei Danilov has been one of the main uh, voices in the Ukraine war. He, uh, They've appointed the current head of the Foreign Intelligence Service of Ukraine, Alexander Litvinenko, in his place. I do believe he's being made to be uh, ambassador to Norway, Um I can't help but think that's similar to Zeluzhny, which is, let's keep him out of Ukraine. I don't know why. I think Danilov, uh, I, I have no, I'm not aware of any issues with Danilov, but then I, I'm not within the corridors of power in Ukraine. But there's obviously some reason he's fallen foul of the government and Zelensky, or maybe he's wanted to move post and I don't know, whatever. But anyway, he's gone, been replaced and will, I think, be going to an ambassadorial position. Uh, that's enough from me. I hope that was of interest. Please like, subscribe, share. Take care. I'm going to speak to you soon.